this video on tracking seeks to understand how the feedforward term works. The first video reminded viewers that a default MPC approach such as GPC does allow you to use future values of the target. And there was your typical control law and you'll notice future values of the target come in through this term here and affect the current control increment delta u. However, what we also demonstrated through many examples is that a typical MPC algorithm such as GPC seems to behave worse when more accurate target information is provided. So in this chapter we're going to seek to understand how this feedforward information is included and hence why this can lead to poor performance and that obviously is the baseline for saying how can we do better. So we need to remind you about poorly post optimizations. Viewers are reminded of the discussions in chapter 3 which illustrated how a finite horizon algorithm can have a poorly post structure. It was shown that if you use small output horizons and sometimes small input horizons and sometimes large control weighting, all of them can lead to optimizations which in fact do not give optimal predicted behavior. Now if that's gone too fast for you, you really do need to go and look at chapter 3 and you'll see the arguments are evolved quite slowly. Now a key check that was proposed at that time was that the optimizations from one sample to the next should be consistent with each other. So the solutions they give should be consistent because if they're not consistent it means essentially you keep changing your mind. And if you keep changing your mind you end up with chaos but it also suggests that a previous strategy was poorly chosen because you've just said that was wrong and I'm going to do something different. And we're going to use the same insight now with advanced knowledge. So this video will demonstrate why using large amounts of advanced knowledge of the target changes leads to optimization solutions which are not optimal and indeed will give you rather poor predicted strategies. Now as with chapter 3 the key starting point is to test whether the class of predictions available to the optimization includes one which is close to the closed loop behavior you actually want because if within your class of predictions you don't have one prediction which is close to what you actually want then clearly you can't get what you want. If that's not the case, then the optimization is unable to deliver a sensible answer. And then you might be saying, well, what is the purpose of such an optimization? Here's a simple example for you then. So consider a system which has something like simple first order dynamics and design an optimal control law okay, to follow a step change in the target. But the key thing you'll see is we've got to take our decisions at this point here. Now if I said to you what sort of input trajectory is going to enable you to follow that target, then you're going to say well clearly I don't want to respond too soon so I'll keep the input zero till I get to about here. Then probably what I'm going to do is first I'm going to go the wrong way first because if I do that um, it means you can then get faster acceleration and you'll see that. Then I might shoot the input up to a large value, then go along, then I might come down a bit, undershoot a bit, go back up. So I've made that up, but that would not be untypical of a sort of input trajectory that gives you a nice smooth output response. And if I now look at the corresponding output, of course it doesn't do anything till you get to here, and then it starts going down, and then it will shoot up quite quickly and come down and do something like this. And so what can you see? The optimum input trajectory requires you to have input changes in this particular domain here, in the domain which is around where the step change in the target occurs. So this is where you want your input degrees of freedom to be. And now what we're going to look at is look at the GPC framework and see where your degrees of freedom actually are. So, just to summary, the best solution is likely to move the input only shortly before the step occurs to minimize errors both sides of the step change. Now let's look at a typical GPC and, um, 
algorithm. So here I've taken ny equals 20 and nu equals 2. So the 20 essentially is this bit here. So I can see 20 samples into the future, but I've only got two degrees of freedom. So all my control moves need to be before this green line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, the best thing to do is probably go down a bit and up a bit. And then, of course, my input has to stay constant because I've only given myself two degrees of freedom. And what sort of output prediction am I going to be getting? Well, it'll go down a bit and then it will go up a bit. Now, if you look at the errors we've got here, we've got one error here, and that will be, say, E20. And then you've got all these errors down here. So that, for example, E18 and E17 and so on. And clearly what the performance index is trying to do is it's trying to trade off the magnitude of the errors before the step change with the error after the step change. And what will happen is because there's lots of errors before the step change, you'll find that E17, E18 and so on are small and E20 is large because that's the best it can do. But the key thing is you'll see that what you get is a small input and probably it will be negative which is what you saw down here it will move the input slightly the wrong way first and then it will move it the right way and so you get a small non-minimum phase characteristic because that keeps the E17, E18, E15 and so on a little bit smaller and clearly you're looking at that saying well that prediction isn't really what I want at all so GPC has only two moves available, so it trades off. Okay, we'll just remove that. Trades off the expecting tracking errors the best it can, but as a consequence, the prediction you get is really rather poor, and it doesn't really mean anything. If you looked at this prediction and you say, does that prediction in any way optimize tracking around that target? And you say, well, not really, not in any useful sense. Now consider the same system with NY equals 20, but a slightly larger NU. So this time, I might, for example, allow that NU is as big as 5. So let's say that NU is now 5. And probably what you're going to get is something like this. The NU will go down slowly, and then it will go up, and then it will be constant. Now, again, I've made that up just to illustrate. I've given myself more moves, but still, these moves are a long, long way away from where the target change actually happens. And if I look at the corresponding output predictions, you'll see they go down for a bit and then they come up. And you'll probably see that, yes, the errors on this particular curve are slightly better than with NU equals 2, but the difference is rather marginal and it's still rather a poor prediction, which really doesn't track this target in any meaningful way at all. Okay, So the key thing is GPC has several moves available to trade off the expected tracking errors the best it can, but still you're getting rather poor performance. And the reason you're getting poor performance is you want your input changes to be in this domain here, but you've put them all the way over here. And therefore, telling the algorithm you've got input changes now to track a target change 20 samples in the future is really rather stupid. You are not going to get a sensible answer. So here's some illustrations from MATLAB. And again, as ever, this MATLAB code is available on the Google sites for you to see. And what we're prop um, plotting is the predictions, the initial predictions when you first see this target change. And here you'll see I've got NU equals 2 and NY equals 20. And you'll see exactly the sort of shapes that we indicated on the previous slide. You'll see the output predictions um, move a little bit because they're trying to trade off this error here with all these errors down here. And it's not a very good prediction at all. If I increase the input horizon to 5, which is what I've done now, you see, yes, things are slightly better, but that prediction is still rather poor. If I try example 2, 
you see you get a very similar sort of shape. Not exactly the same, but the same sort of pattern. Again, increase NU equal to 5, and you see the same sort of pattern. It's really not doing a very good job. And the input predictions, if you didn't gather, by the way, are this sort of magenta curve down here. And you'll see the inputs are really not moving very far at all, because it's saying, well, really, I want to keep all of these output predictions at zero in this region here because that's what the target is. So what's gone wrong? The degrees of freedom available to GPC are the control moves now. In order to track a future target change, the best place for the input changes are around the time that the target changes. And as this is not the case, the best solution that GPC can come up with is inappropriate at best and could be very poor. So an analogy that you might relate to is if I said to you, design a sequence of steering wheel changes in your car that are implemented only in the next two seconds, but are designed to take you around a corner which is 200 yards away, you can clearly see you are not going to get a sensible solution. Because if you move the steering wheel now, um, when the road is still straight, you will go off the road. And more to the point, when you get to the corner 200 yards away, you've got no steering moves left, and therefore you can't get round the corner. And you can see clearly this is madness. It makes no sense at all. Now, we can do things a lot better. So good tracking requires the control activity to be around the set point change. So if you look at this one here, you'll see that the input trajectory, this magenta curve, all the key movement is in the region of the target change. And as a consequence, if you look at this output prediction, it, some of it moves before the target change and some of it after the target change. You say, that looks quite good indeed. So what did I do to make this work? Well, in simple terms, in this example, I only allowed GPC to see six samples ahead. I restricted the advance information to six samples, but I used NU equals 10. So in other words, my control freedom bridged where the target change was taking place. And therefore, GPC was now able to come up with a sensible solution. So in summary, we demonstrated that although the default definition of GPC includes information about future targets, it does not use this information wisely. The use of a finite control horizon means that the class of available input predictions is only flexible enough to deal with set point changes which are within the control horizon. So in other words, including more accurate future target information into GPT is often counterproductive because the required changes in the control trajectory are not available to the optimization.